Well, let's spend a little time talking about how DNA is organized in chromatin. In this illustration, what you see are several orders of structure of chromatin, starting at the top with DNA, naked DNA, double helical DNA. It first associates with a number of proteins called histones, and we'll see more about those later. The double helix wraps itself around histones, a, a core of eight of them plus H1, another histone, so nine histones. And these form structures which you can see in the electron microscope called nucleosomes. They, in uh, aggregate, look like beads on a string, and we'll actually see that in a moment. And that would be the 10 nanometer filament referred to here. And the 10 nanometer filament coils up to form a 30 nanometer fiber. The 30 nanometer fiber, in turn, coils again to form looped domains, uh, which are actually loops of DNA protruding from a protein-rich scaffold in the center. And I'll have a photograph to show you what that is. Now, some of these transitions from nucleosome or 10 nanometer filaments to 30 nanometer fibers and to loop domains occur or are the result of the addition or accretion, if you will, of proteins to these structures. We refer to the histone proteins as the basis for nucleosome structure and other proteins that associate with DNA to form chromatin and ultimately chromosomes as non-histone proteins. And not shown in this picture uh, are the roles of non-histone proteins in associating with the 10 nanometer filaments to create these higher order 30 nanometer structure and loop domain structures. But that's what happens. And finally, in the run up again to mitosis, as you approach prophase, more proteins attach to the chromatin, to the structure at this point that are loop domains, to force them to compact, to cover over the DNA in the loops and create what we usually uh, call a chromosome, that this, this thing that we see in metaphase, which actually contains already duplicated DNA in chromatids. These are a pair of chromatids, and what happens at the constriction that you see, this is where the microtubules of the spindle apparatus will attach and eventually pull the chromatids apart, and each of the chromatids then becomes a chromosome in its own right in a daughter cell. So there's our metaphase chromosome, and as I said, you get these higher order structures because more proteins, more different non-histone proteins, have attached to the chromatin to force it to fold and, and coil into even more compact shapes. So here's how we come to understand chromatin structure. I have a photograph here of a uh, nucleus in a cell, and if you fractionate the nuclei, you treat them with a low salt concentration, and then look at what you get in the electron microscope, lo and behold, you see 10 nanometer filaments. The 10 nanometers, by the way, refers to the diameter of the little beads. And what are the beads? The beads are those nucleosomes we talked about. How do we know the structure of the nucleosomes? Well, that will become apparent in just a bit. So these were what were called beads on a string, uh, by analogy. If you take the beads on a string, the 10 nanometer filaments, and you increase the salt concentration, you get the 30 nanometer solenoid. The solenoid, by the way, refers in electricity or electronics to a coil of wire, and so the analogy here is the 10 nanometer filament is coiling up on itself to form a solenoid-like structure. That's three times in diameter what the nucleosome beads are. All you need to do is increase the salt concentration, so clearly there are ionic uh, interactions, charge interactions that are responsible for the transition between the 10 and the 30 nanometer structures. The 30 nanometer solenoid becomes um, um, looped structures, and the looped structures can condense into chromosomes, and this is by the addition of uh, more uh, proteins, the non-histone proteins. Let's analyze what happens if you treat DNA, um, that is pure DNA, shown on the left, with the enzyme deoxyribonuclease, an enzyme that catalyzes hydrolysis of the phosphodiester bonds. Well, if you treat pure DNA with deoxyribonuclease, or DNAs for short, you're going to get rapid hydrolysis down to the nucleotide monophosphate breakdown products, right? Uh, AMP, CMP, TMP, GMP. What if you take the 10 nanometer fibers that we've isolated, the nucleosome beads on a string structures, and treat them with DNAs? Well, they will, they will undergo hydrolysis, but it will be relatively slow. Uh, nucleotide monophosphates will accumulate slowly, and uh, you won't get any or as much hydrolysis at the end. So why the difference? It should be clear at this point. It's because in the 10 nanometer fiber, these nucleosome structures, the histone proteins are blocking the access of DNAs to DNA. They're protecting the DNA from digestion. And that's why you're not getting the rapid hydrolysis 
down to nothing but nucleotide monophosphates. That suggested an experiment that's shown here. So beads on a string could be digested with a deoxyribonuclease, in this case a particular one called deoxyribonuclease 1, and a complete digestion, one that uh, was allowed to proceed for a long time, resulted in the nucleosomes being broken apart. And so basically, when you look in the electron microscope, what you saw were these beads. Now I've drawn the bead to suggest the octamer core of proteins in the nucleosome, uh, but they all broke apart, and you would see them at random in a field in the electron microscope. Well, what if I digest with deoxyribonuclease 1, but for shorter times, say for several different times? So in other words, I would put a, set up a tube, put in the 10 nanometer filaments I had, had uh, extracted, and then throw in DNase 1, and then every minute or two I would pull a little sample out and see what had formed. Well, as you would expect, the necklace of nucleosomes tends to get shorter and shorter over time. Well, you could actually separate the DNA that was left behind after the digestion in electrophoresis on a gel that will separate the DNA by its length or its size. What you would predict is, on the left, the complete digestion would lead to very small size fragments, those which basically surround the nucleosomes if you throw out the, the proteins. If you extract and throw out the histones on the sample on the right, it should contain a number of different sized DNA molecules differentially protected by two, three, four, five, or six, or however many nucleosomes were still left. And that's what you actually see when you look at a, a, a gel. These are um, from a textbook, which means they're probably third, fourth, or fifth generation from an original photograph, so they're not the best. But trust me, the results are essentially what I'm going to tell you. In the electrophoretic gel on the lane in the left is undigested uh, DNA. So in other words, that's 10 nanometer filaments that never saw DNA. And all you see is uh, some material at the very top of the gel where the slowest material runs, and the slowest material is the largest material. So the largest DNAs run the slowest, and all you see is high molecular weight or high length material at the top. And that's expected because if you have 10 nanometer fibers and you haven't treated them with DNA1, you don't have smaller pieces. The middle lane contains an example of what you see after digesting with DNA for a short period of time. And as you can see, several bands have formed, and they are numbered here, 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1. There's still a fair amount of undigested material near the top of the lane, suggesting that that uh, DNA digest time was not enough to completely attack all of those 10 nanometer fibers. But you are getting several different lengths of DNA, and I'll talk about that in just a second. In the last lane on the right is a sample that was digested for a longer period of time. And what you are supposed to see, and what you do indeed see, although you could argue that this picture doesn't show it well, is that the bands that formed, the lower molecular weight bands that are moving faster in the gel, have increased in intensity relative to a decrease intensity in the larger sized fragments of DNA. So what does all this mean? Well, let's take a look at the cartoon of what might be going on on the right. And start at the bottom. The number one band is the smallest band, is doing the longer digestion, doesn't produce a band any shorter than that, that number one band. And we can determine how many nucleotides are in that band. It's 146 bases long, or 146 base pairs in double helical terms, right? And that must be the amount of DNA protected by being wrapped around the nucleosome. That was the amount of DNA in a nucleosome, if you will. Is that possible? Well, if you take a look at some of the larger structures, let's look at band two. Well, that's 350 nucleotides. 350. Well, okay, so 146. What is that? 292 nucleotides. If you had two nucleosomes, you would expect to produce or protect 292 base pairs, wouldn't you? Well, not exactly, because then there's DNA that represents the string between the beads. So if one nucleosome has 146 nucleotide pairs in it, and two nucleosomes has 350 nucleotide pairs, and every nucleosome protects 146 nucleotides only, then 58 nucleotides, or approximately 58 to 60 nucleotides, must be the length of the DNA that connects two nucleosomes. Is that possible? 
Well, very, very much so, because you can do the arithmetic for yourself by looking at the third, the fourth, and the fifth bands. The sizes of the DNAs that you get are 550 nucleotides, 750 nucleotides, and 950 nucleotides. Again, if you do the math, you will see that if you allow 146 nucleotides to be the amount wrapped around each nucleosome, then you get a constant roughly 60 nucleotides between each nucleosome. And so you begin to get a picture of the 10 nanometer filament in terms of the length of DNA that comprise it. And that portion which is protected by the nucleosome from DNA digestion. So here we have our 10 nanometer filament again. Here we have our digestion. We're down to single nucleosomes because this was a full digestion or complete digestion of these 10 nanometer filaments. And now we're going to analyze the protein. So let's look at the proteins that you get out of the nucleosome. And this is, by the way, how the structure of the nucleosome was worked out, how we know that they are made up of these histones, and how we know that the nucleosome is comprised of eight core histones and, and another histone called H1. Here they are. You take the proteins, you throw away the DNA, and you run the proteins on a gel. So you put the proteins on the gel, you apply a voltage drop across, you know, you take a power supply, DC power supply, and you run the gel, and there are the proteins separating, and it turns out that there aren't dozens of different proteins at this point. The 10 nanometer filament is really just made up of DNA and five proteins. And these are the histone proteins, H1, H3, H2A, H2B, H4. These are historically derived names. I will not expect you to remember the actual names, but the histone octamer around which DNA double helices actually wrap themselves contain two each of all of the histones except H1. And there's one molecule of H1 that is associated with each nucleosome. An interesting feature of these histones is that unlike most other proteins, they are very rich in the basic amino acids. The basic amino acids, if you go and look, you'll see that they are lysine and arginine for the most part. These are amino acids whose side chains have amino groups at pH 7, neutral pH, the pH in nuclei and cytoplasm, the amino groups acquire a proton and become positively charged. So basic amino acids have positively charged side chains. It's reasonable that proteins that are going to associate with the very electronegative DNA molecule, DNA double helix, should in fact be positively charged at the same pH. What do I mean negatively charged DNA? If you remember, uh, the double helix is held together by H bonds between the bases, and the outside of this double helix is actually the phosphodiester backbone, and the phosphates in the phosphodiester backbone are negatively charged. So it shouldn't come as a surprise that the proteins most intimately associated with DNA, the histones, are those that are highly basic, which is to say will have a positive charge. Now if we take a look at the DNA we've yanked off of the nucleosome prep that we just made. We take a look at that DNA and you run a gel of it under these conditions. You get a single size class of DNA and that size class is of course 146 nucleotide pairs long. We've already seen that in the last slide. So the final conclusion is histones in a nucleosome and specifically the ones I've shown you here protect 146 nucleotides from DNA's one attack. Well in going from a 10 nanometer filament shown in A on the left here, and cartooned alongside it, to the solenoid, or B, shown in the lower figure on the left, and cartooned alongside it, is a mechanism that's been proposed to explain how uh, 10 nanometer filaments might condense to form the solenoid and might even uh, undergo several transitions. And this will become apparent, the need for this will become apparent in just a second. And so, from your textbook, it's as if the solenoid could expand and contract much like the pleats in an accordion, or the bellows in an accordion. I said earlier that I would show you the looped domains of DNA. This is not quite fair. This is actually an extract of chromatin that is showing you the loops uh, and uh, some portion of the scaffold proteins that are at the center of these loops. And those are DNA loops, the looped domains. And what's really interesting is that the proteins in the scaffold in this extract of chromatin, uh, of course there are non-histones, but they are largely 
one kind of non-histone. There are other proteins in here, too, which we will not have a chance to discuss, but quantitatively, a major component turn out to be topoisomerases. And that's interesting because it suggests that there are many, many so topoisomerases in the scaffold in sufficient quantity, obviously, to relieve supercoiling during replication of eukaryotic DNA during the S phase of, of the cell. Now let's take a look at the different forms of chromatin that you can see in a nucleus. Here's our nucleus again. We recognize heterochromatin and euchromatin. The darker uh, granulated stuff in a nucleus is typically referred to as heterochromatin, and the lighter granular stuff inside a nucleus is euchromatin. There are two sort of grayish areas in this particular nucleus, uh, in this cross-section, and those are the nucleoli, uh, which are built around the portion of DNA that actually encodes ribosomal RNAs, and so nucleoli are the source of ribosomal RNA synthesis, in particular uh, 28S and 18S and uh, 4S RNA. So that brings us to the end of this presentation.